Stanford University. My name is Audrey Yao, and I serve as the Director for Fellowships in Energy and Sustainability in the Precourt Institute for Energy, as well as at the, at the Sustainability Accelerator. I'm fortunate to be moderating today's panel, where we're going to be highlighting some of our newest Stanford Energy postdoctoral fellows, focusing on sustainable energy. Today, joining us on the panel, we have Luca Violetto, who's working on sustainable nitrogen fixation, Eli Lazarus, working on energy economics, and Leah Adler, working in bioenergy. How many of you have heard of the Stanford Energy Postdoctoral Fellowship Program? Raise of hands. One, great, two, excellent. Don't worry for the rest of you who don't know about the Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. It's a relatively new program. In fact, we launched it just a year and a half ago and we brought our inaugural cohort of fellows here just last year in 2023. Under uh, Yitzwe, our faculty director, under his vision as well as the guidance of our advisory board, this fellowship program, this is a postdoctoral fellowship program, and it has a really very simple but clear mission, and that's to cultivate energy leaders. So no pressure to you all, but we expect great things. <laughs> um, the fellowship program itself is quite competitive. We award eight to 10 fellows a year in all areas broadly defined energy research. So that can include science, engineering, policy, and economics. And really, we're focusing on people and projects that are really there to address the challenges of the global energy transformation through interdisciplinary approaches. The fellowship focuses on professional programming that prepares them to take on leadership roles in energy in all sectors, including academia, industry, government, and nonprofit. And we also focus on creating a community of fellows that will allow them to achieve more than they could as a scientist on their own. So it's really a unique fellowship program that's really built on a cohort model. By the end of this year, we will have 18 fellows working in a diversity of areas. During this panel, you'll see a selected few speaking specifically about work related to sustainable energy. I just want to quickly acknowledge that we have a number of sponsors for this fellowship program, and we wouldn't be here without their support. So huge thanks to, of course, our initiatives at Precourt who are supporting us, as well as the Tomcat Center, and also the Diane Lee family, our, our first donors to the program, who've really launched us off. With that, I'd like to invite our first panelist to speak about their work, Luca. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I am uh, Luca Vialetto. I'm working uh, in the Department of uh, Aeronautics and uh, Astronautics. Uh, and uh, in particular, I will talk to you about uh, technology that is based on plasma for food and agriculture in order to achieve sustainable nitrogen fixation. And this is my main topic today. So first of all, uh, let's start from the bigger picture, right? So the way uh, we produce uh, most of the fertilizers nowadays based on the Aber Bosch process. And this has been uh, recognized by several colleagues as one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century. So the process uh, is based on putting together nitrogen and hydrogen, and together with catalyst is used to form ammonia. Ammonia can be used then as a nitrogen carrier or in a further oxidation process in order to produce nitric acid or nitrates that are used for agricultural purposes. In order to give you an idea of the importance of Aber Bosch, here we see in this plot the projected growth of the population as a function of the year that is expected to reach almost 10 billion people in the world. And this is strongly correlated also with the use of fertilizers. And these are mostly produced, as we know, by Aber Bosch process. However, there are some, some problematics in the current ways that we produce fertilizers, mainly in three different areas that I'm going to uh, explain now. The first area is the production. Currently, Aber Bosch is performed at moderate temperature and extremely high pressure, so the production is extremely centralized, done by billion dollar industries that emit several amount of greenhouse gas. Because the production is centralized, then we have to transport this synthetic fertilizer to the field, and this has a particular problems that the farmers pay at the gate three to five times higher the cost of the fertilizer. The third problem is the application. Most of these fertilizers are not tailored to specific type of cultivation, so they are not effective to the type of cultivation that you want to grow. So, and this is a, 
problematic and uh, uh, there are several type of research nowadays at Stanford and outside trying to ha have sustainable way to have nitrogen fixation. So we had some panels before of people doing catalysis. I will explain an alternative technologies to produce ammonia here. The key research idea of this project is actually to use plasma in order to achieve nitrogen fixation. And the idea is relatively simple. So we start from renewable electricity, from solar or wind, air and water, and we form a plasma out of it. And this plasma is put in contact with water in order to form a plasma activated water that you can see here in the middle where different chemical species are sold in the water. And this water is then used to grow plant and enhance the growth of this plant. So let me now just go do a step back and uh, try to discuss a little bit the fundamentals. So what is plasma and why are we using, why are we interested in plasma technology? So we are all very familiar with the three state of matters, uh, solid, liquid, and gas. And what happens if you put electrical energy into a gas is that you can strip off the electrons out of the atoms and the molecule in order to create a new state of matter that is called plasma. Plasma is an ionized gas that uh, in particular is created at room temperature. And the particular thing is that uh, we have very hot electrons, electrons but uh, the gas is at room temperature so we can exploit non-equilibrium type of chemistry onto different substrate, also biological substrate as you can see. So there are actually already several industrial plasma applications here. We are in the Silicon Valley. Probably you know that most of the semiconductor fabrication, the cell phones, laptops, are produced using plasma technology. Aerospace, and the reason why I'm working in aerospace department, right? So electric propulsion is based on plasma technology. Medicine now, if you go to hospital, cancer treatment, sterilization is done through plasma and also nuclear fusion that is not at the industrial level yet, but is attracting a lot of, a lot of private investment. So how can we use then plasma to fix a nitrogen at scale? And this is what I'm going to talk about uh, now. And especially, I will explain to you three different levels of feasibility, scientific, technologic, and economic feasibility. By the way, every time we design an experiment, these are the three most important levels that we should consider. From the scientific feasibility point of view, we have seen in current experiments that we can enhance the growth of the plants if we use a plasma activated water instead of normal tap water. And this has shown some promising results already, despite it is a relatively new type of application. Moreover, we can do different things rather than storing chemicals into the water. For example, with this technology, we can control the pH of the water. And this is very important, for example, to absorption of carbides or for system of irrigation. Moreover, this type of technology can be used for water disinfection. And this is already economically competitive with other type of technologies at the industrial level. And this is important, for example, for food processing. From technology feasibility point of view, this is the type of devices that we are talking about. You see that uh, are type of centimeter type of device uh, where there are some electrodes represented by the black uh, stripes here. And the pink or, or purple part here is really the plasma that emits the light in between the electrodes here. And you see that we can be very creative in the type of shape of the electrodes that we can use, either have a flat finger, any type of configuration as you can see from the mesh here or stripes type of configuration. And the most interesting thing is that uh, different type of shape of the electrodes influence the performance that we have in the plasma activated water. And this is really, really strange if you think about that. From economic feasibility, right? Economic here I mean in terms of energy efficiency and yield. So here I plot the energy consumption or cost in megajoule per mole of nitrogen as a function of the yield. So the amount of NOx that we can produce with this type of system. As a reference, you see in the bottom right corner also the upper Bosch process that have a, a very high yield and a relatively low energy consumption optimized throughout the last uh, hundred of years or so. 
And here you can see that uh, uh, we have tried really, really hard experimentally to try to push towards higher yield and also lower energy efficiency, now actually competitive also with other Bosch process. And this all depends on the, also the different type of sources that we use in order to create the plasma. So despite this technology is relatively new, we have uh, achieved uh, you know, results that are economically viable. So however, so there are still some challenges that are very important. Uh, you know. The mechanism of plasma activated water are extremely complex. I mentioned some of the technology difficulties before, for example, related to the electrode configuration, the plasma source, uh, but also the type of treatment uh, It's important. So how much power, what type of gas should we use, right? And also, since we are dealing with biological system, uh, how much time do you treat the water, in which condition the plants are growing, these all affect the final results and uh, the, the final product that we have. And in order to understand actually the interplay between these different variables, we need actually combination between experiments and models that can guide the, the optimization of this type of technology. So my research goal is in fact to understand the interaction of plasma and water, to model it faster, because we want to have next generation of products and reliably in order in the future to guide the design of these new plasma sources. So let me tell you what are the ingredients of this understanding. And so of course uh, we have to describe electromagnetic fields that are present in the plasma, transport of species from the gas phase down to the liquid phase. And also we have chemistry, and this is one of the most uh, interesting thing in my perspective. This is chemistry happening in the gas, but also at the interface with the liquid itself. And once we have general understanding of this, we use computer models in order to create the models of this and try to first validate the model and then optimize the, these type of reactors. If you are interested in a computational model, I also have a poster later where we can discuss some of the most technical details about this type of technologies and different computational methods. So let me summarize, and as you can see, plasma is a promising technology for water treatment. Moreover, there are some interesting, exciting uh, new direction of the field. So recently, colleagues uh, have been exploited also, instead of treating water, directly treating seeds, for example, to uh, enable and enhance immune responses, uh, and uh, so to customize this uh, small seed and enhance growth and uh, the um, resistance of this seed towards bacteria infection. If we look uh, back also as a community, the advancement of this field is also relies on the importance of sharing data. This is important to optimize experiment and also models. So recently I've joined also the board of an international project called LSCAT, where we provide experimental and theoretical data available as open source in individual databases, as well as tools that you can use in order to assess how different chemical reactions occur in different type of system. And this is one of the directions that I hope also to push towards my direct, my, in my future research. And with this, I would like to thank for the funding of the support and thank all of you for your attention. And I welcome also any further discussion later. Thank you. We'll go ahead and uh, leave the, or save questions for the very end. I'd like to invite Eli up uh, to talk a little bit about energy economics. My name is, as it says up there somewhere, Eli Lazarus. Um, and I'm going to briefly present my research, um, that which uses a novel open source um, package to do a particular type of economic modeling. Um, clicking where? Yeah, and, to t and the modeling that I'm doing will be testing uh, questions around climate change and, and um, energy and the relationships between those. Um, I think most of us are here, at least in part, because of this little problem that we're all facing uh, as a species, climate change, and um, the significance of energy generation and use in, in climate change as a problem. So. I'll come back to this briefly later, but these are just uh, recent numbers that came out from the EPA's 
maybe you already saw this, but like recent um, greenhouse gas inventory report that just came out. And this is where we're at. This is 2022 numbers. And as we see there, you know, vast majority of emissions, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions are from are related to energy. And then uh, again, just to set myself up here, um, in the minority, you know, there's a lot of very interesting technical technological work, and and you know, very 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 smart people doing a lot of important work uh, in this field. Probably you, you know, all of you as well, obviously. Um, but um, climate change is a huge externality, right? It's an economic externality. And so markets on their own are fundamentally skewed towards causing climate change. That's how we got here in the first place, in my opinion, we can talk about. Uh, and there's uh, systemic, um, what does this say? Inertia. You know, we have inertia in the system at multiple scales. Um, so my focus is uh, focused on the economic structure and the interactions with energy, emissions, climate change and, and policy. So I work with a particular kind of macroeconomic modelling that's particularly useful for thinking about this issue called computable general equilibrium modelling. So I'm going to talk about that in general really quickly, or as quickly as it makes sense. Um, then I'm going to talk to you about my new open source package for doing that kind of modelling, um, why that's useful and why my package is super cool. And um, then I'm going to talk briefly just some current research, which is sort of getting going on using this package to do, you know, answer actual research questions, uh, which we'll be developing over time. Here it is. This is CGE modelling. That's the acronym, Computable General Equilibrium. It's a numerical macroeconomic modelling. So it uses real data. So we have observed data from the economy that you know has been collected, structured and organised. And with that data, uh, we create a, a snapshot of the entire economy. So macroeconomy, thinking US, and I'll present um, briefly a US, a model of the US economy, the whole thing. Um, and it's all mathematically balanced. This is the, the um, way that the modelling works, the general equilibrium modelling. It's all mathematically balanced so that um, everything that's being produced in the economy is consumed and it, and it all sort of matches up, all the inputs equal the value of the outputs and so forth. Um, we have firms, we have consumers, we have government represented and um, equations that map the relationships between these different elements in the model, right? So we've got this equilibrium model, everything's kind of in balance, agents, and then uh, relationships between all of them intricately sort of connected through equations. And this is the whole structure of the thing. And it starts in balance, right? This is the equilibrium level. And then when we want to figure out what would happen if X was changed, so we do some sort of small change, a perturbation I called it here, so some sort of counterfactual situation, you would say like, what if we change this policy? What if we change the availability of this you know, input? What would happen to the entire economy? And because everything's connected in the way we model it, we can see not just like the immediate effects, but everything as it flows through the economy, all these relationships and all mapped and constrained by the equations that are, are, are set in, in these kind of models. So it's a super useful uh, way of thinking about the economy and of testing policy, especially policy that doesn't have actual you know, implementation that you can see in the world and test. Uh, maybe some policy that's in one place, but you want to you know, you, you think about it in, a, in an economy that has a different structure because it captures all these interactions. There's a lot of interdependencies in the economy, if you think about it, right, as you probably imagine. This affects that, affects this, affects that. So this is, it's particularly good for that kind of thing. However, this is sort of where my work comes in and my notes. They're quite, quite complicated to build, right? You've got all these variables, but they're interacting, right? So these inputs go here and then they go there. These firms take, you know, inputs from that firm that go then into another firm's inputs and so forth. Um, so you're building kind of complicated models. They're hard to update because of all these interacting terms. Um, you know, variables are appearing in all different equations at the same time. So if you want to change something, you kind of got to change it in a lot of different places. That makes them error prone. And they're kind of like a bunch of equations. So they, you know, have been critiqued in the literature as a bit black box. Like, all right, you tell me that this is going to happen, but it's based on 
you know, a bunch of equations that you can't really sort of look at very easily. So um, there has been some work. Where am I at? Am I at clicking point? So there have been some projects that have, have built tools to make the CG modeling sort of less hand, you know, drawn. So they sort of do some of the work for you, but they're um, based on software or use modeling languages or use sort of algebraic languages that are, uh, require licenses and they're a bit esoteric, a bit obscure. And so um, work that I did in my PhD uh, built an open source sort of version of one of these kinds of uh, software packages. So it's for building CG models um, and it does it in a particular way that makes it very, very efficient, which makes it you know, faster to build. You can sort of set a model up, then you can make a small change fairly easily and it'll populate through the whole thing without having to do it all in all the different places. Um, and it's all open source, so that's the key thing here. So it's open source, the package is open source, it's built in the open source uh, language Julia. So everything all down to the base code is all open source. You can see like where the code that I built with my advisor depends on another package or everything in that package is all open source. You can look at that code, you can use it for debugging, goes all the way through. And then because it's Julia, and Julia is a general use open source language for scientific computing, um, it, you can also link like CG modeling applications to any other kind of like plots or, you know, um, distribution stuff, you know, basically anything you would have from some package built in a language that's general use. It, you know, a lot of functionality that you can use to combine with the CG modeling because it's open source and because it's in uh, Julia. We were able to do this in particular because um, there was another package within Julia called Jump, so we're in the left column of the table. Um, and Jump basically replicates uh, this other functionality of this language GAMS, one of those licensed languages, so um, general algebraic modeling languages, is that what it is? Nobody knows? I know. Um, and Jump basically does that, but built in Julia. So we were able to use that as an open source version and build on top of that with, um, that's a general sort of equilibrium and optimization programming uh, functionality, Jump does, and we put this uh, economic specific thing on top of that. And the arrows there represent the fact that we're able to go out from there and you know, just go to plotting and, and, and do other sort of data, you know, whatever structure stuff and anything that you want because it connects more easily than GAMS does. And for, just as an illustration of that in my PhD, I did a little model, US model here. Um, and then I did a sensitivity test based on some of the parameters in the model and I just varied them. I used a few packages like distributions, I took random samples, I ran a Monte Carlo, I ran like hundreds of times and every time I varied one of these inputs and then these uh, plots show how the outputs would change based on small changes on the input or like various changes and you can see the, sort of that sensitivity. So just a pretty easy thing to do based on the package and this sort of integration with the Julia uh, functionality. Um, one thing I wanted to show you here, I don't know if this is going to work out, but anyway, the point is, this is the, a model of the entire US economy in 2017. So it's like, that's the whole thing. Wow. I think that's pretty cool. It has every sector, like every sector, it has 71 sectors. So it's the interactions between all of those sectors and, and this sort of has actual, the, I cheated a little bit, the, the data part is coming on a later slide, but like all the data of actually how much was bought between you know, agriculture and forestry, it's all kind of in there of all the different sectors in this one page of code more or less, right? And you know, it's indexed, I'm cheating a little bit, but like it's pretty efficient, that's the point. And then this was a really bad idea, so I'm just gonna get through it. And this was an example, of, I don't know, sorry about that. So. <laughs> I had an idea, but it wasn't a good idea. And this was just to say, all right, I skipped all the data load part. It's just data loading, but like it took a little, there's a few lines there. And then what I wanted to show you now is, uh, you might, I'm, I'm late, I know, but kind of late. So I'm working now to kind of actually start doing research questions using this package as at the same time we're continuing to develop the package to make it faster, to have more functionality in it, to do a bunch of cool stuff with it and link to a lot of other stuff. Um, and so just as a sample, I'm going to talk about my current research question, which is um, um, greenhouse gas taxes and interested particularly in the interactions, right, which is a complicated thing. You have a tax on, on like something big, carbon, 
which will have some sort of impact, which would be hard to predict on an, in and of itself. But then if you have another tax in some interacting way, like methane, this is another big greenhouse gas, as we all know, that's going to have its own effects. We could, with some challenges, sort of estimate what the impacts of, say, that would, tax would be. But the combination of them is going to interact in sort of potentially unexpected ways. So that's what I'm looking at right now. At a, as a first sort of look, which I'll probably be doing over a while, because it's an interesting question, and, and I'll, I'll build up in complexity. Um, that's just background and additional data around why methane is also important and interesting. And it's related to energy, but it's also related to non-energy stuff. So that's what we're going to capture, be able to capture with this kind of modeling. And then I wanted to show you this, which is another one of these cute little things where it's like, I had that national model of the US, which is actually comes from an op another open source project, like all the data and the model structure itself from WinDC. Um, and then I added these lines of code. This is sort of to get the structure from its base form to something that could answer that question. Slightly more than that, I also altered those two in this way. And that allows me to add a tax and a slightly different structure to think about how, in particular, sort of like agricultural activities might be affected in a different way than uh, carbon and energy stuff. And sort of here, just some quick results. I did a mock-up. This isn't real data, well, it's real data of the modeling, but not real like tax levels and all that sort of stuff. It was just a quick mock-up to get me some numbers in a, on a table, so it would look cool. Um, and then I'm way over time, so yeah, there's a bunch of work to do. It's really exciting, I promise, and um, research questions, but also a lot of um, development of this package uh, that's going to be super cool, including like connecting to the open source data project, WinDC data, and then some international work I'm looking forward to over time to kind of incorporate not just US stuff, but um, this is, you know, important sort of methodology that is being used around the world, but like with all this license stuff and whatever. And so go on there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eli. I'm sure there will be plenty of questions later on. And hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time. But if we do run out at the session, there is a reception immediately after. So all of us will be there. Feel free to find us afterwards and ask us questions there, too. I'd like to invite Liat to um, give our last presentation of actually all of today. So hi, I'm Liat. Um, I work over at the Carnegie Institute for Science. And I'm one of the um, incoming fellows for this year. And I'm going to talk to you about algal photosynthesis and how I think we can improve it and harness it to use for bioenergy. So, oh no, everyone picture an algae. <laughs> I've just biased you all. But I think a lot of you might be picturing this, which is some green soup. Um, but this green soup is very impressive because it's capable of 3 to 5% solar energy conversion. And by that, I mean it can take light in combination with CO2. And it will produce biomass as well as oxygen. Now, I'm sure some of you have been listening to some solar panel talks, which we know are more like 20%. But if we compare this to land plants, they're only capable of about 1% to 2% solar energy conversion. So algae really are like the king of biological photosynthesis. And it's not just any old biomass that they're making. They're making really highly specialized chemicals. Um, they can make nu nutrients that we can eat. So I'm sure some of you would have had uh, some spirulina in your smoothies. Um, they are, of course, making these lipids, which can be converted into fuel and even aviation fuel. Um, they can make pharmaceutical compounds. And um, there is some more recent work that is harnessing algal biomass used for carbon capture. So there's so much potential with algae. But we know that there is this huge problem with the cost of harvesting algae, cultivating them, and extracting all of these amazing compounds. And so my research is trying to understand how we can um, basically boost the productivity of algae, um, which will partially get us to um, closing this cost gap, which we kind of want to make the algae between five and 10 times more productive. So what is going inside this green soup? What's going on in these green bags? This is what I see when I think of an algae. This is uh, Chlamydomonas, which is a green algae. And it's sort of like the model algae that everyone uses. And they have the original solar panel, which is these membranes here. So 
So these are the photosynthetic membranes. This uh, ball is called a pyrenoid, and this is where CO2 fixation happens. And the cell also has its own energy storage in the form of these um, starch molecules and also lipids. And the bit that I'm interested in is how we go from harvesting light to then providing energy for all of these processes. Uh, now, I'm hoping some of you have heard of ATP. Uh, you might know that the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. It's actually the chloroplast um, because it can make way more ATP. And ATP, if you don't know what it is, it's a very high energy molecule and it's sort of the currency of the cell. And it gets made by the electron transport chain. So in those membranes that I was pointing out to you earlier, um, there are these various complexes. And when we get light, an electron will gain energy and it will move along this transport chain. And as it goes along, it will catalyze reactions that will result in ATP generation. Uh, this process is amazing. It's the reason why we're all here. Um, and understanding it can open up a lot of opportunities with algae, crops, and many other things. Um, but it's not so simple. The one that I just showed you is called linear electron flow. And this is present in all plants and all algae. But algae are special because they have um, additional pathways. So they have one called cyclic electron flow, which sort of cycles around this electron transport chain. And it's not as efficient, but it's helpful because it has this inbuilt protective mechanism. There's another one called pseudocyclic, which is very similar to linear, but it um, has an alternative endpoint. And this is the most efficient pathway. It's really strong, but the cell kind of only uses it in emergencies. So if there's like a sudden flash of light, then the cell will um, turn this on to deal with it. So based on what we know about these electron flows, can we use them or tweak them to try and boost productivity? Because this is what is making the ATP. So one way to do this would be to remove the least efficient pathway. So we're removing that cyclic one. And as a result, we're getting an upregulation in the pseudocyclic or PCEF. So we're boosting the conversion of electrons, light energy, to ATP. So we're getting all this extra ATP, and hopefully we're going to get some more lipids out of this. And that is exactly what we see. So we see a huge two times increase in the amount of lipids. And for biology, with one change, this is really great. So why is this not my project, and why am I not trying to you know, get a startup going? It's because that cyclic electron flow was doing something. It had this protective mechanism. So if we take a look at some algae, this is algae growing on a plate and we expose it to a really high light. The normal cell has its little umbrella, it's protected from the light, and it's growing OK. But when we remove that protection, the cells will die. So even though they're making loads of lipids, they're not useful for us because they're just not going to grow. And so the project that I'm going to start is trying to more intelligently tweak these electron flows to boost the productivity, but you know, keep the photo protection. So one idea I have for this, if you remember the cell, it's very nicely organized. Um, things are told where to go. And so one thing I'd like to try is to spatially separate these two processes so that they're no longer competing with each other. Um, and then we can keep the PCEF on and we stop it getting shut down. And that way, the cell has got more ATP available, but it still has photo protection. And the other way that I'm going to try is using time. So algae at the moment, when we use them for lipids, we often will have two phases. We'll have a growth phase, and then we'll have a lipid production phase. And we can tap into that by having the cells grow as normal. They have their cyclic flow. They're protected. And then when it's time to make lipids, we'll switch it off, boost them up to their most efficient pathway, and then we can get this double lipid production. And so just to talk about the impact of this, obviously a twofold increase is really great. It's really good for biology, um, but it's not quite this five to 10 times increase that we need. And the great thing about this is that it's very compatible with other modifications that we might make, because we're starting right at the beginning, where we're going from light to chemical energy. And there's so many other things that happen after that that can be you know, stacked on top of this. And finally, as I said before, um, 
Electron flows are really fundamental to life on Earth, and understanding them will be very helpful for algae, but we could also improve crops. And so I'll leave you with my summary, which is there, is, there are multiple ways to do photosynthesis, and if we can understand them and tune them, we can boost lipid productivity in algae. Um, so thank you all for your, your attention. Um, these are my mentors and my funding sources. Thank you for your time. All right, let me quickly uh, look at everyone's faces once again. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. You heard quite a breadth of research that we're, ha we're, that we're doing in the Energy Fellowship. Um, we have people working on innovative technology, looking at sustainable nitrogen fixation. We have people working in bioenergy field. We also have people in the economics, um, energy, climate modeling area. So I would love to hand it off to all of you to see if you have any questions that you'd like to ask our panelists. Arpita is in the back with a mic if, you, if anybody wants a mic. I can start off the panel because I'm actually quite curious myself. You know, the fellowship program is a three-year program. What do you think are the biggest challenges that you're going to be facing in the next couple of years in developing the technology, the models, the research that you're doing in all of your respective fields? Let's start with you, Luca, and we can work it down. Yes, yeah, so, so thank you very much for your question. Uh, so from uh, uh, in my perspective, uh, so there are uh, several types of challenges. Uh, one challenge uh, is uh, specifically related to the technology uh, and to the modeling simulation. So we, in particular, we can model these charges in air quite reliably for uh, short time scales. However, the treatment time typically of water is of the order of uh, several minutes or even hours. And this is currently out of reach for uh, most of the simulation or computational model that we are doing for high fidelity. I think that the new methods uh, are required to bridge uh, this uh, longer time scale while having high fidelity model. Another challenge is the availability of atomic and molecular data, and this is connected to the broader international project that I started to join, where people are doing quantum mechanical calculation as well as experiments trying to extract how chemical reactions interact. The the other type of challenge is that we are not dealing only with physics and chemistry. We are dealing with biology. And as you know, biological systems include different type of variables that are interconnected. If you are treating seeds, every seed is different. It's like people, right? And uh, so how you do that? How do you make statistics out of it that is relevant? So I think that when you are combining all these interdisciplinary projects, it's uh, what is exciting, but also what I expect, uh, where I expect the challenges will be. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, As the biologist. Yeah, <laughs> expert in that. I think Lucas, yeah, he's stolen part of my answer there, is that even though what I proposed is inherently seems quite simple, I'm sure when I try it that the system's going to respond in an unexpected way. Um, I propose two ideas. I think the first one is more risky, even though it's more beneficial. Um, so and my other one with the time. I'm quite confident in that one because we've seen it work already and we just need to switch on and off, which is, I think, a low stakes approach. But yeah, I think going for the big changes is hard and biology is unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, I think like all the pieces for me are going to come together. Um, I don't feel like I have sort of like a experimental sort of hurdle as much as just holding the whole thing together is, is sort of the challenge as I move forward. There's a lot of really cool stuff that I want to do and it's like economics and it's coding and it's kind of like holding all these different pieces all at the same time, the data connections and all that. So uh, it's, a, it's like logistical and time. Yeah. But I'm, I'm set to go. <laughs> Oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to just say. Yeah, it. if we have a question. Is <laughs> uh, you the Do you price? want to use a mic? Uh, did you adjust the price of energy in your model? And if so, um, was there any unexpected effects? Yeah, I'm still def like super early stage and actually I'm plotting like actually doing this particular question in the model because again I'm holding this like development side of of this whole program at the same time as kind of using models to get it going. So um, I don't have actual results for that I can quote on anything at this point. But uh, like even in the so what I did was just a mock up for this. Like I did this like a couple of hours the other day to just have something. And it, it already shows like that when I incorporate 
both kinds of, let's say, these taxes, which are really just present, you know, the tax represents some kind of cost, you know, some internalised cost. And when I do incorporate them in the different ways, they're definitely not just, as you would expect, like the sum, the, the, the outcomes are not the sum of both, right? And they don't all overlap and they interact in really different ways. So a, a lot of di interesting results are going to come, but I don't have them yet. Yeah, I wish I did. I will. I should have said, yeah, I will, shortly, any minute. I have a question, one for Ellie and then one for Luca, but let's start with Ellie. Um, you model the entire U.S. economy, so at least cool, you, huh? you, you, you tease us with the idea, I know. And uh, we have, U.S. economy is uh, rather complex because we have 50 states with different minds and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And when you look at California as a place which is very prominent in U.S. economy, but does things that are somewhat suicidal, so companies start moving to Texas. Mm. How does this model in your in yeah. your modeling? So there's different ways to do these kinds of models, and scale is an important factor. What I have now, which is early work, because it's sort of simpler, really, is this national level model. So it doesn't account for any states. Um, but I'm also like replicating a state level model for the US economy. Again, building off this free data source of this um, WinDC project, which I'm also repping here, like Wisconsin Data Consortium, and they already have a state model. So you can do the same thing that I'm doing, which is start with a basic model and then do what you want to answer your question, incorporating all, actually 51, because they include DC. And then you can incl include the interactions between the different states as well. But it's, it, you know, it scales up exponentially. So. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Luca, in your, in your program, which is purely agricultural program, do you have any interaction with people who work in agriculture? Or is this te theory of aerospace industry? <laughs> No, so, well, uh, uh, because uh, of the different application at Plasma Herb, uh, so I'm embedded in the uh, aerospace department. Uh, actually, different people in our group are working with different type of application where plasma can have an impact. And uh, we are interacting with other experimental group uh, that uh, do actually test uh, on fields, uh, and they tried uh, the application of plasma activated water into for lati lattice uh, cl crop or different type of plants uh, as well. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward actually to have more interaction uh, into that as well. And uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's very important. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So a, a question on the algae. Um, as a complete non-biologist, uh, the stretchier idea, I think, that you said, which is, you know, have one half of the cell mm. do one half of the other, do the other thing. Um, does that mean you would cut your productivity in half? Oh, I see, because we're splitting it between the least. Yeah, just one cell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, so. yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the idea is, is that we want to try and get the most efficient one running constantly. But as it stands, it gets shut off pretty quickly. So we're just trying to separate it from the thing that shuts it off. And we don't need, you know, they're probably not going to be running equally. Um, it will be some kind of balance, and it's just boosting that PCEF so that it can be running instead of just ha coming on in these little flashes. Um, it probably won't be like one side of the cell each. It will maybe be forming like these little clusters that are isolated that are sort of, yeah, insulated from the inhibitory effects of the other one. I can't believe it. We're already at 4.30. Time went by so fast. I want to give our panelists a moment just to say maybe a word or two, maybe a sentence or two of sort of the impact you hope your work will have. Um, and we'll wrap the panel up that way. That's all right. Luca, do you want to go first? Uh, yes. So, well, uh, first of all, I hope that uh, in the future, the technology we are using, uh, it's helpful, uh, actually, uh, to have different type of application of plasma interacting with complex surfaces in agriculture, but also in chemical production. And uh, more generally speaking, so if I have to look at where I am now and what is 
the aim of what uh, drives actually my research uh, is actually also to educate the next generation of scientists in general of people uh, that can use this type of technology but they can also rationally think about you know quantitative uh, in, in a quantitative way i think it's very important to and i think it's the biggest impact they can have in the society so in the educational point of view yeah i think for me i would just really love to see biofuels finally make it um, i know that algae have a lot of problems um, but I really believe it's possible. It's just hard. Um, and we're getting closer all the time. And I think this change could really nudge it forward if it works. Um, and yeah, I also want to stay in academia and <laughs> you know, teach everyone about algae and get, and not, yeah, they're just so special. They're really amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Your little algae. Yeah. <laughs> I want to um, solve climate change. <laughs> So, I don't know. I've got three years, I guess. Is my... <laughs> We're already late. I mean, I, you know, so I have some, I think, really interesting research questions. I am also really um, enthusiastic to kind of really share the open source aspect and, and give the capacity to people in different places around the world and researchers and sort of um, build the ability of people to be, be able to do work that they would otherwise not be able to do and make this kind of modeling more accessible um, in various places that's important to me and I'm hopeful about that. And I also have sort of other, you know, a lot of research questions, really interesting stuff about thinking about beyond climate change because it will be, will be done soon um, to be able to think about, uh, I'm actually really, obsessed about externalities in general. So I, I, my work is sort of infinitely on with uh, modeling around externality stuff. Thank you all so much for staying to the very, very end to hear from our fellows. And I want to thank our panelists as well for the conversation. A friendly, friendly reminder that we do have a reception going on right outside at the fountain. We have additional student posters that are going to be, I think there's something like 40 posters out there. Food, well. drink, everything. Luca has a poster out there. If you want to talk to Luca in more detail, please come out and join us there. Otherwise, thank you so much all for being here. Thank you.